very briefly, I sort of a uh, we, we talked earlier about um, slaves that get convicted in and what happens to them after emancipation. One other after emancipation episode that I was curious about that you mentioned early on in the book was um, the slave from Maryland, which is rented out in in Virginia into Virginia and works right. in the Shenandoah Valley. And this is sort of like, uh, this is, I think, the perfect conundrum for the Emancipation Proclamation, right? It's like mm -hmm. the, the Virginia, the valley is in rebellion, but the slave itself is owned by somebody in Maryland, right. which is loyal and wouldn't fall under the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, not sure if you have the answer, but mm -hmm. how does this work? <laughs> Yeah, it's that's that's another great question. So it's 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 not clear cut. So the the story I think you're referencing involves um, a fellow named Shipley, who was uh, again from a from a Maryland enslaver rented to the to the Walls family in Stephen City, and you know he he flees in the spring of '62 to General Banks. He uses um, you know federal soldiers to come and claim his wife, and they get out. They go to Baltimore, and the ultimate plan is, is to get north. The wife ends up getting sick when she's in Baltimore and she dies. But again, this is one of those things where we don't know what happens to Shipley. So we have the story, you know, they're, they're getting out of the valley, okay. But, you know, as you noted, they're, they're going to a place where, where emancipation doesn't apply. Yeah. And so it, it would, you know, it would be a very interesting legal case, I suppose, if, if you know, to look at that and say, well, Mm -hmm. ultimately is is he based on on all the the rules that are in place at the time right. is he entitled to his freedom mm -hmm. um and and again you know what happened to him we can't say for certain his wife again as i said you know sadly sadly she died but but these are these types of very very complex questions mm -hmm. of you know he is you know, and this is this is happening in '62. So under, you know, that, and this is still first confiscation act time. Second hasn't gone into effect yet, which might give a little bit more, you know, clarity to things because the walls were, you know, Confederate supporters and sympathizers. But yeah, I mean, these are these are the questions that that I think there still needs to be some some clarity and answers to. And and I and I think you know, and I, and I know you certainly believe this, and and. When when historians write a book, um, we we want to contribute to the discussion, mm -hmm. and but hopefully also entice people to to research some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that you did a one of these with Ken No, mm -hmm. and his and his you know terrific book, um, The Howling Storm, and you know Ken is a is a good friend. He's on our on our editorial board for the for the journal. Right. And, and he makes this point in the book. Yes. And I think he made this point during the interview that, that he doesn't see this as, even though it's a doorstopper of a book, <laughs> he doesn't see it as, as the final word on this, but rather something that's going to encourage um, additional scholarship and research. And so this would certainly be one of those things, you know, how do federal authorities deal yeah. with? Um, so, I mean, if, if Shipley, he is owned by a Maryland slaveholder, if that Maryland slaveholder found out that Shipley was back in Maryland, you know, mm -hmm. does he make a does he make a run to try to get him back? Right. Um, and it would be interesting to to look at to look at those those legal questions. Right. Well, hopefully, maybe somebody who does genealogy reads your book and maybe finds one or two answers. Um, yeah. That I mean, they having been in a different archive, all of a sudden yeah. obscure item they can locate. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah.